Front Street. Hello, I am going to make a fret position marking template. I'm going to use a, a lump of aluminium and I'm going to put a series of notches in it to mark the fret positions. And I am going to do this with engineering precision. Um, certainly better than 0.1 of a millimetre, hopefully better than that, 0.05 of a millimetre. So this is more of an engineering video than it is a woodworking video. <laughs> but I'm going to do quite a long intro to this video because there's a couple of things I want to explain which I think I think are important I think they're important in in this regard in in in, in the regard of positioning frets accurately where do we position the frets well the way we do that is we go on the web we go to a fret position calculator and we read off the frets according to our uh, scale length the scale length I'm using here, by the way, is, let's call it the Martin small body scale length. It's 24.9 inches, but in millimetres, I think that is three, well, I know that is three, 632.4. That's the scale length we're aiming for here. Um, but the way these calculators work is, is actually, I think, fairly easy to understand. I have a degree in mathematics here, <laughs> but... I, I think it's worth understanding these things because it gives you a better insight into how the guitar works. What we have is a thing called equal temperament. What this means is the guitar plays roughly in tune, it's not precise, it is an approximation, but it plays roughly in tune regardless of whether, regardless of where you are on the neck of the guitar. You could say that it plays the same amount out of tune regardless of key. <laughs> um, I'm not going to get into the differences here between equal temperament and just intonation or true temperament, um, but equal temperament is, is a compromise, but it's a compromise that's been around for a couple hundred years and it works pretty well. And the way it works is the ratio of the frequencies of two notes a semitone apart. That ratio is the same regardless of where you are on the neck. And that ratio is the twelfth root of two. It is 1.0594 something. It's roughly 6%. And what that means is if you want to get the frequency of the note a semitone above where you currently are, you just multiply by your magic ratio, your 1.059, your twelfth root of two. So for instance, if you've got the A string on a guitar, which is 110 hertz, then the first fret, the B flat, you will get that frequency by multiplying by 1.059 and then the B you will multiply again by 1.059 and you'll keep on multiplying until you get to the octave position. Now the definition of an octave is it's double the frequency of the bass note and you have multiplied by 1.059 12 times and that gives you 2. That's why it is the 12th root of 2. It is the number when multiplied 12 times up gives you um, 2. So, when it comes to the fretboard, just as the frequency is going up by that ratio each time, the length of the string is coming down by the same ratio. So if we start with our 632.4 millimetres, then that's the open string. To get the first fret, we have to divide that distance by 1.059, so we get a shorter length and that is the length of the, the new length of vibrating string. That is the distance from the first fret to the bridge. And then for the second fret, we divide by the ratio again and we get a shorter distance, and that's the distance from the second fret to the bridge, and then the third fret, and so on and so on. Until we've done that 12 times and we get to the octave, and we've got a length that is half what we started with. We've doubled the frequency, we've halved the length of the string. Hopefully you're with me. So to get the position of the frets, what we do is we take that ever decreasing number and we just subtract it from the original scale length to get the positions of the frets relative to the nut. And that is what string position calculators do. 
and that is what I have calculated in a spreadsheet on my iPad which I will be using during this video um, because I've got to introduce another little bit of compensation because I'm going to be measuring the the, the nut slots uh, the nut slots the the, the the locating slots I'm going to be using my calipers uh, and measuring from the inside of uh, the slot to the inside of the next one so each measurement has got to be 3.1 millimeters less than the, the position of the frets. Maybe I'm overcomplicating it at this point. But that's how we calculate where the fret positions are. Now let's consider how we're going to make the, the template itself. I could do this one of two ways. I could either have the end of the template in the nominal nut position. So the idea is that we glue the template onto the fretboard and we we have a prepared fretboard end and we glue the template on lining up exactly with the end of the fretboard and then the first notch in the template will be the first fret position and we can do it that way but that means that the the, the locating peg in the mitre block has to be directly under the the saw blade which is doable because the saw is never going to saw straight through the fretboard hopefully um, but it, it's one more thing to worry about we've got to make sure that the, the, the mitre jig is set up precisely not just to cut square but also to cut um, in exactly the right spot relative to the locating peg a much easier way of doing it is to have a in effect a zero fret position marked on the template so we have a little notch somewhere near the beginning of the template and that notch corresponds to our let's call it our zero fret position but effectively the position of the nut and then when we take the fretboard out of the jig with all the slots cut in it we then cut through at the zero fret position to create the end of the fretboard and then we know that everything is is measured correctly it's all relatively measured correctly or is it? <laughs> because this is where I started thinking a little bit about this. That slot is great if you want an actual zero fret, which I don't. But if you've used that slot to then cut through, you've reduced the length of the fretboard by half the kerf width of the saw blade. So given that I believe that is the way most luthiers do this, why isn't it a problem? Because you'd think if most luthiers do it, then it clearly must work. It can't be that, that I've spotted the problem that nobody else has. So what's going on here? To understand this, we need to consider nut compensation. Okay, so bear with me. Nut compensation. Imagine we've done a setup on a guitar. And we've done it by only considering the fretted notes. And to do this, we've put a capo across the second fret. And we've treated the 14th fret as the octave position. And we've got all the setup done and we've adjusted the saddle. And we've got the intonation set on the saddle. And so the heavier strings, the saddle is a little bit further away. And we've got it all set up so that everything plays perfectly in tune. All the notes are the right relationship between each other. Every note we play on that fretboard, every fretted note, is exactly in tune. And then we take the capo off. We then have to consider what happens with the open strings. Because the fretted notes, when you fret a string, you very slightly raise the pitch. Okay? Which doesn't happen with an open string. So compared to the fretted notes, the open strings are very slightly flat. And this is only a few cents, but it is measurable. And this is what a compensated nut is trying to correct for. What you do is you bring the position of the nut forward slightly to, to sharpen the open strings. And this, um, the amount that you do this varies a little bit from string to string. Um, and it, this is more to do with the compliance of the string. It's, it's, it's not so much to do with the weight of the string. It's, it's more to do with how easy it is to bend the string. So it, it's more to do with the core. <laughs> Maybe I'm getting a little bit too complicated at that point. 
I might put an edit in the video here. Hmm. But what I'm trying to say there is this, you're compensating for a different effect here than you are at the saddle. With the saddle, you're compensating more for the fact that there is a dead spot at each end of the string because of the stiffness of the string. The, the effective vibrating length of the string is a little bit less than the physical length of the string because the string is stiff and it's not really vibrating at the very ends of the string. What we're compensating for at the nut is a different effect. It's how much the, the, the tone goes up when you bend the string and that's more to do with the core rather than the windings around the, the string. So what you might find is that you might find that all of the wound strings are compensated roughly by the same amount and that's different to the open strings um, because they are thinner than the cores of the wound strings and probably overcompensated, overcomplicating it at this point. But the point being that there is the compensation is anything from a half a millimetre to one and a half millimetres. I had a look around the internet to see whether how, if people had published how, how much this effect is and it seems to be on a well set up guitar anything from 0.5 of a millimetre to 1.5 of a millimetre. So what this means is that say on the E string um, the nut compensation you've introduced you've, you've actually pushed the nut closer to the first fret by half a millimetre and this can either be achieved using shims against the nut glued to the nut or a new nut is created which overhangs the fretboard so you can effectively bring the nut forward or people have actually shortened the fretboard in order to achieve this and maybe shortened it by as much as a millimetre and a half at the base end either with a slightly slanted nut or the whole fretboard has been uh, shortened and then the nut you cut into the nut and you cut into the nut more at the treble side where you need less compensation and, and perhaps you don't cut into it at all at the bass side. I hope this is obvious <laughs> but the point I'm making here is that the minimum amount of compensation you need to introduce is generally about half a millimetre and that is the same as cutting down the slot of the zero fret. You're reducing the width, you're reducing the length of the fretboard by maybe as much as half a millimetre, particularly if you then sand the uh, the sawn end of the fretboard um, flush, you, you get it nicely prepared. Um, you will have shortened the fretboard by a small but significant amount and introduced nut compensation. So in fact that's a good thing and in fact you could make an argument for reducing the length of the fretboard by as much as a millimetre and a half. I'm not sure whether I want to do that but it's a decision I can make later on when I cut the end of the fretboard off. Um, if I want to do a compensated nut that could be a useful thing to do because then when I compensate the nut I'm cutting into the nut, I'm not having to bring the nut forward over the end of the fretboard. So I think that's quite a good thing. So I'm probably going over the top here in explaining this, but I think it's worth being aware of these things when you're making your jigs and whatever and when you're cutting your fret slots. Because even if you don't do a compensated nut, I think it's worth being aware of what's going on here. So I hope this really long intro is, is useful. Um, let's get on with the actual engineering. I'm using this as if it was layout fluid. I couldn't get hold of any layout fluid. I was sold a pot of layout blue, which will appear in the shot right now, um, which is a different thing. That's an oil-based paste um, for um, transferring between surfaces so you can check how surfaces mate up with each other, I believe. But unfortunately, the shop sold it me as if it was the alcohol-based ink. I don't think they knew what it was, really. Um, and while I guess this method using Sharpie is basically the same thing, it would be a lot quicker to be able to brush on layout fluid. The idea is that I can then scratch through the surface of that and then I hope all my lines are going to be very clearly visible.
I am aware that you cannot see the markings, but uh, let's see how we get on. Just about at the first scratch. Yep. I'm curious to know, hey, can I measure such a small gap? Yes, I can. It's 2.2, so I've got to widen another millimetre. And I'm curious to know what one stroke of the file equates to. Actually, let's, that, let's just tidy that up first. Right, now let's measure it. The trouble with measuring such something so small is I've got to get the calipers lined up precisely because of the offset in the jaws. This won't be a problem when I'm trying to measure the gap between slots. So that's 2.32. Two strokes of the file. Two point three eight. Ooh, three point one two. We must be nearly there. Oh, so close. <laughs> we are there. Nine. 32.39, we're within 0.1 of a millimetre. I suspect the slot isn't quite square. 32.33, that's pretty much it actually. Yeah. I will leave it there. I think we're there and I've just got to get the slot wide enough to put the uh, pin in. You may have noticed this is now a brass rod. I, <laughs> I checked they are the same diameter. So close. I'll probably keep saying this for the next few strokes of the file. Ah, there we go. We're in, and there's, yeah, that is acceptable accuracy. And if I put both of these in and try and keep them parallel, we should get a good measure of uh, into whole diameter measurement, if I can keep them parallel. This will probably split the MDF, as this is a 3.17 peg into a three millimeter hole. Ah, we're okay. What I now have are three little tools 
which will hold the pegs nice and square and enable me to get much more accurate measurements. And I have one that is 0.3 of a millimeter narrower so that I can get it in just as I'm coming up to the proper width so that I can determine which side of the slot I need to, uh, need to widen. For the next few frets I'm going to be referencing against fret 1 and uh, 150 millimetres worth of measurement that will take me up to fret 6 just fret 6 occurs exactly on that, that line um, so then I'll have to re-index at 6. You shouldn't really be measuring between individual frets because it, it compounds any errors but I'll only have I'll only compound errors twice going up the neck um, so by the time I, I do it the second time I will have reached my 21st fret I think maybe the 24th um, but we'll do th this way for now and measuring this it would appear that my little scratch there looks to be very accurate this one not so much so so I've, I've got to just be a little bit careful I think I'll try and get the the far slot accurate first and then bring it back this way um, but this is why I'm doing it this way because um, it, it isn't depending on my sawing ability or my marking ability I can just file until it's exact actually thinned my measuring pin down a little bit it's sort of millimeter short so it will just fit in a little bit more fit in once I'm within one millimeter of the correct width which I'm hoping is about there yeah nearly should be able to easily measure and that's 36 millimeters exactly so we've got to go 0 0.6 of a millimeter that way uh, 0.67 of a millimeter that way so that's what we'll concentrate on next there we go 36.67 there is so obviously I've got to keep my hand steady there is some variation if I squeeze a bit but generally I'm getting within 0.04 of a millimeter so that's fine now we've just got to take a little bit off here until this fits nearly there we go so that's within one whisper of the file. No play. Hmm. I was aiming for 36.67 and we're reading 36.6. So I think that's okay. <laughs> I think we're, we are within 0.1 of a millimetre. There we go. 68.27 or 28 so that is exact so now we start to file this way until we can get the full size pin in simple yeah I'm getting better at this <laughs> there's some variation in the readings but that's maybe 0.04 of a millimeter within <laughs> Maybe one stroke. There we go. And that actually is reading exactly, oh, well, it was reading exactly. 126.31 one, one, was what we were aiming for. This is the last fret I can measure from the first. 
and it's measuring 1.592 which is fortunate because what we want is 1.52.9 so we're within 0 0.02 so that's good did I say one? yeah 1.52.9 so uh, this will become the next index pin we'll move this up and apparently introduce a 0.02 of a millimetre error in the next next set of readings. Light the controls very slightly. There we go. Five to four, and I was aiming for 28.27. Paying a bit more attention to how square the slots are and. Uh, Pretty good actually. It's possible the jaws are narrower than the body. Yep, the jaws are. We're there, but we've just got to take a little bit off the lip. Perfect. Very snug, but perfect. Threat done. <laughs> oh, again, the jaws are just slightly too narrow. <laughs> As before, I run the risk of introducing errors, but I was getting a measurement to within 0.02 of a millimetre of this, so I'm not too concerned about that. And we will not have to re-index again, because uh, this will now do the, the whole of the rest of the fretboard. This is the 13th fret. <laughs> Should be 19.92. We're reading 19.96. 24th fret done. Should measure 143.52. <laughs> Pretty close. Oh, can you see that? There we go. 143.52 I was aiming for. I'm quite happy with that. Sharpie is alcohol soluble. Well, that was pretty intense. Uh, that is tiring work. There's a, probably about six hours work in this. Uh, towards the end, I was getting about six frets an hour, uh, but it was pretty slow progress at the beginning and very tiring, the concentration needed, but I got there. Um, some, some tips, um, things that I've learned. Don't rely on your eyesight um, your judgment to get the slots vertical. You need to get the, the slots parallel sided, well, not, uh, perpendicular. Uh, use a set square. Don't, don't rely on your judgment to get that um, because you'll end up with play in the slot, um, particularly if, if the slot is sort of shaped like this because it'll drop through the top and then it'll rattle around inside. I've largely avoided that, but I think one of these down here, maybe the zero fret, um, did have a little bit of play. Um, still less than 0.1 of a millimetre. I've achieved, I'm happy that I've achieved 0.1 of a millimetre accuracy everywhere. Better than that actually as we go up the up the fretboard. To the, at the top here, um, I was getting to the accuracy of of this, the calipers. Of course the whole of this is only as accurate as these calipers are able to measure, um, which in theory is 0.01 one of a millimeter. Um, I was maybe getting 0.03 millimeters accuracy. Um, I was out by a couple of uh, couple of hundredths in places according to this the measurement of this. Another thing I noticed, I scratched the uh, initial nominal me measurements of the slots using a ruler. And I checked before my, my three devices, my accurate ruler, my, my big ruler, which 
I wondered whether it was accurate, but it, it agrees with this very closely. And they both agree with my calipers. Uh, I, I measured using the ruler initially, the scratches, and although it, they seem to be fairly accurate down here and up here, some of the marks uh, around the middle part of, of the, let's call it the neck, were as much as half, maybe more than half a millimetre out. And I think this is because of parallax errors. I'll, I'll review the video, but I think, I suspect I was looking at the ruler from the side and I wasn't getting an accurate measure. So if you're, if you're going to be measuring your frets by hand on the neck, on the fretboard, uh, beware of that. Make sure you're lined up with the ruler um, because you really need to get them as accurate as you can. Hence the benefits of using a template like this in conjunction with my mitre block. That will be a future video, probably not the next one, um, but uh, I will be making an indexed mitre block um, for soaring my frets. So, <laughs> I hope you found that all useful. Um, I think I'm going to go and lie down in a dark room and let my eyes recover. Um, but it's, it's been rewarding. I'm really pleased with the result. I'm, I'm happy that that is as, as accurate as I could possibly get it, really. So uh, click like, uh, subscribe, comment, share the video, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>